Hello and welcome to In the Trenches with Mo and Hess. He's Mo and I'm Hess. And here we are at the end of week five of the NFL season. With Sunday here, we've got just about every game being played except for the game tonight where we're going to watch the New Orleans Saints and San Diego Chargers. And then the Monday night game tomorrow night against the Houston Texans and the uh, New York Jets. As we look at uh, this NFL season and where we are in week five now, I think one of the things that stands out is these young quarterbacks. We, we seem to have this, this new group of young quarterbacks that are kind of coming of age. We've got Andrew Luck in RG3, Cam Newton in his second year, Matt Ryan, uh, you know, is, is, is a little bit older, but we see him coming of age. We've got Andy Dalton, who's in his second year. Mo, what are your thoughts about these, these, these young guys as they come up and develop you know, what do you think, you know, where's the state of the game as we look at the elder statesmen as far as the quarterbacks, you know, the the uh, the Peyton Mannings and, and uh, Tom Brady's as they start to get older and are eventually going to phase out of the league. Where do you think we stand in the quarterback position? Well, I would just like to say, welcome to the NFL RG3. You got Ooh. your eggs scrambled. You're officially an NFL ball player. <laughs> Somebody just got knocked. Out. <laughs> hey, but uh, real talk, man. Matt Ryan down the Falcons undefeated. He's been real strong at home. Until he can get over that home game, that hump in the playoffs and yeah. win the playoff game. Absolutely. I don't think that we can really put him as on the rise quarterback. Right now, it's the home field factor and it's a strong defense. Yeah. Uh, Andy Dalton, he revived the Bengals. I mean, him and that young wide receiver Green, that Georgia boy from Green. It's hard to cheer for him, but he's a hell, hell of a ball player. Luck, Stafford guy. Shredded it today. Show why he was the number one draft pick. You ain't and, uh, He is the heir apparent, and he is the successor, the right successor, I believe, to take Peyton Manning. Cam Newton. You know, he's, he's in his sophomore, sophomore year. He's getting having a slump. But you know what? A lot of people want to blame Cam. Everybody want to blame Superman. But even Superman had his kryptonite. And Cam Newton's kryptonite is his management, the leaders of his team, failed to build an organization around him. They was going to ride this young man's back, and they did not give him any more help. Other than Steve Smith, they were signed two running backs for the play action. But who gives a dang if you got to play action if you ain't got nobody to throw it to? And Benji Olsen today was almost a non-factor in the whole game. You know, So the, the, the Panthers and Cam Newton got a lot to do, and I hope they get it figured out because this is my prediction. He's uh, in a couple of years when his contract up, he will no longer be a Carolina Panther if they cannot right the ship and give him some help. You know, Mo, I think you're right, and, and that would be a crying shame. You know, as we look at an undersized wide receiver in Steve Smith, you know, if he falls susceptible to injuries, you know, his speed is his biggest weapon. Obviously, he catches well, but I think you're right. They do need a deep threat or someone who can take some of the pressure off. And, and with a young talent like that, you know, we see what happens when you got these guys, you know, who have multiple pieces of the puzzle around them and how well they can do. And I think it would be a travesty to see Cam not do well uh, if this continues. So, you know, I like Coach Rivera, you know, as a former player. Uh, I think they're going to get it figured out. But uh, hopefully they get the all the support that they need and they make the right personnel move. You know, as we talk about these young quarterbacks, you know, us being O-line, you know, the one thing that I, I, I struggle with now as I watch the game, I don't see the pride in the O-lines. And the offensive lines, as we look around the league and we see some of the things that are happening to the quarterbacks. You know, Michael Vick, you know, he's always on the ground. He's always getting hit upside the head. To me, back in my day, when we played, you took it personal when your quarterback got hit. What's the deal with this? Here you go. Two old linemen remembering back in the day when we was the guys. <laughs> Yeah, man, you know what? And you can say that all you want, but the truth of the matter is O-line play is definitely a lost art form. Yeah, you have some rising stars out there, but come on, man. Every week we got six to seven sack games, and this is spread offense these guys running, so it's designed to get rid of the ball now. Right. And these guys are getting through. I know the zone blitz is getting more and more complicated. They got more and more reads. You got the younger quarterbacks running these offenses. Yeah, you can make excuses all day. But at one point in time that these offensive linemen got to have pride. They got to put their hand in the dirt and say, look at the defense lineman and I say, yo, I'm better than you, and I'm going to show you that I'm better than you all day. And you don't see that type, of, that type of pride. You don't see that type of hustle. You don't see that type of mentality right now. And the game itself, I'm not going to say it's getting soft, but the game itself is lacking. And I would like to see more, man. You know, I, I would like to see more. And it's not just an old lineman saying that. 
this is a football fan. This is somebody that loves the game, and I love what happens in them trenches. And we believe that you can't have a game without the offensive and defensive line. Oh, that's right. And right now, the defensive line, I think, for the whole league as a whole, is, is great not better than the offensive line. I think you're right. And, you know, I think this, this is, you know, we bring it up as we talk about what happens in the trenches, but I think it's something we see all around the league right now. I think there's been a movement away from fundamentals and moving more to scheming. Everybody is scheming things. And when you get away from technique and fundamentals, the position doesn't matter. Tackling. Tackling in the NFL is terrible right now. You got a couple of teams who do it well, but beyond that, it's terrible. You know, the offensive line play, the defensive line play. You know, defensive line, you know, we used to always joke those guys don't have to do a whole lot of thinking, a whole lot of technique. They're just reckless. But the positions that require more talent, the wide receivers who have to run crisp routes and the things that really matter, it's a lost art. And I, I want to see it come back. Get away from scheme, get more into back to the technique and the fundamentals of what makes the game great. But, you know, that's just a old, you know, has been talking about the way I was taught, and I think it is a lost art form. Well, right now, the NFL stands for not for long, and we all know that. We joke about it. That's the nickname all players have. These, college, these coaches come in, they know if they don't win now, they're not going to have later to try. Uh, so they have to scheme, and they have to get it out there and get, get his team out there to play. Uh, the practice time is down. The use of pads in practice is down. So, yeah, fundamentally, you're losing this, this, this fundamentals all the way back to high school now. And yeah. soon we're going to lose it in, in, middle, in, in middle school and Pop Warner. So, you know, the game is emulated from what you see on Sundays. And, and, and the fundamentals have disappeared. The scheme has taken over. Now, I believe the coach's job or the coaches on the sideline are starting to become almost more important, if not just as important as the players on the field. And when it comes to play calling, when it comes to making adjustments, I think that these players are becoming more dependent on the scheme and on the system. And they not depending on what their, their ground and their foundations is, which is the fundamentals of the game. Well, you know, I think the good thing is, is just like all things, this is cyclical. You know, once the scheme breaks down and the fundamentals go to zero, there's going to be a resurgence because that's what has to happen. That's the only way you get better. You know, in the game of football, it doesn't matter what offense or what defense you run, the fundamentals, the technique how a game is done. So I think we are, you know, we are seeing it fall, but eventually I think it will revitalize and come back around. You know, with that being said, Mo, talk to me about, you know, what was your motivation? You know, you were successful in high school, you know, went to Florida, won a national championship. When you got to the NFL, you know, what was your motivation to be successful? Was it the money? Was it, you know, Pro Bowls? What was it that made you want to be you know, what you ultimately were striving for. It boils down to these words right here. I hated losing more than I loved winning. And the one thing I didn't want to do, and, and I played on television a lot in college and in the NFL daily every week, but what I didn't want to do, my motivation was I didn't want to embarrass my parents, my family, my friends, the ones that looked up to me, the ones that cheered for me, supported me. You know, uh, one time my wife, uh, somebody asked her, why did Mo have a bad game? And I was offended. I was upset about that because, you know, she shouldn't have to defend my actions as a man or as a football player to somebody in the public. So it was my mission to never make sure that never happened. Uh, I laid it down on the field. I believed in my team, the team concept. I believed in just getting the job done, you know. Uh, as a lineman, I believed in this, this one mantra, not my man. And if you got all five of them guys believing not my man on every play, it's not going to be your man and you're going to have the strongest unit. And that, and that came to fruition uh, back in 2002 when the Oakland Raiders had the best line in the league, the league MVP, and one of the best rushers in the game. You know, we, we bought into that, and that's something as a unit that we was blessed to be together so long that we just instilled that in each other and we believed in that. And, you know, that's huge. And, you know, my motivations were not that far different from you. You know, uh, I was the only male in my family, so I was carrying on my family's name. And the, my name was on the back of the jersey. And, you know, whether it was high school, college, or pro, I, every time I stepped out on the field, I felt like I was carrying a representation of my ancestry. And so what I did on the field, you know, I, I couldn't take plays off because that to me was a negative you know, for me. And then, you know, I had, I was fortunate enough, you know, I was undersized being six foot one and a half. Yeah, I was told, you know, they called me a midget. They had fun with that. But you know what? This midget made it to the NFL, you know, and it, that that was, I had coaches, Div Division One 
uh, coaches when I was in high school told me, you know, you're too small to play D1 football. And, you know, that, you know, was a massive motivation for me. It was something where it was like, I'm going to prove you wrong. I'm not going to prove you wrong. I'm not just going to play, but I'm going to be all conference. I'm going to be all American. And then there were those who said, ah, you know, you won't make it in the NFL. And so those types of things compounded upon my own desire to, to achieve the very best I was capable of, continually let my fire and made me be better. You know, and, and I think that, uh, you know, every guy has a different motivation. But I'll tell you this, the guys who, who ultimately I saw fail were those who were solely motivated by money. I felt like as I watched those guys, I could always see them and they never lasted because money was not a big enough motivation, you know. But, um, Mo, tell me this. Here we are, week five. You know, we're seeing some highs and lows, ups and downs. We got an undefeated team in, in, uh, in Atlanta, and we got teams that are struggling. We have the things that always go on this time. What has impressed you thus far? Is there a team or is there a unit within a team that you've seen, you know, at this point in the season where you're like, you know what, this team's impressed me with what, they, what they're doing? I think right now it's, it's it's too early to fight. I mean, you never know what team in the NFL is going to show up at right. this point. Uh, I think real teams are defined in, in, in November and December. I mean, October, you're still trying to figure out what all your toys do. What what can I get away with? What can I get away with? So I'm not going to jump the gun and talk about any of that. But I can jump the gun and talk about something that happened great yesterday. Did y'all happen to catch them Florida Gators whip up on them LSU oh. boys? <laughs> he ain't gonna talk about it because the Kansas City, the Kansas oh. Jayhawks just got they back. <laughs> but uh, you know, I'm not gonna finish with Go Raiders today because I gotta go Gators. Moen has signing off week five. We'll see you again next Monday.